It's been quite a week. It's been quite a fuss this week about Steve Chalk again. Have you come across this? Okay, well, recently Steve Chalk, who we knew when uh, we were in South East London, when I was an assistant, he was just down the road from there doing a thing that ended up with the Oasis Trust being formed. Tribally, he is an evangelical. Tribally, he is in evangelical meetings, goes to the right conferences and attends the right meetings. Tribally, he's an evangelical. Uh, he's come out with a number of things in recent years. First of all, um, I, think, I think in chronology it was like this. First of all, he came out with a statement about the atonement and that uh, a biblical view of the atonement is actually wrong. Um, that was the first thing. And then he came out re more recently in support of gay marriage, uh, that, you know, as long as it's love, that's okay, sort of thing. And he's just come out with something on biblical authority, biblical infallibility and biblical inerrancy. And of course, he, he still self-identifies as an evangelical. Now, where do you stand with that? In itself, that's not shocking. In itself, t to me, in, in, in the way I see the thing, um, it's not shocking that, that false prophets will come along. We're ready for that. But we're not so ready for them to come along dressed as sheep, but when they're wolves. And that's a problem. How do you relate to that? What shocks me is, is, is neither of those two things, neither that Jesus warns that this will happen, nor that it happens. What warns me, what, what shocks me, is when you read by far the majority of evangelical responses to that sort of thing happening. You find a guy like that and his teaching being treated with deference and respect by those who claim to be evangelical teachers of Scripture. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us to do that. It doesn't tell us to do that. Ah, but you see, you mustn't cause division in the church. Paul is saying, by doing this, you are not causing division in the church. You are clarifying its edges. And that's what Titus 1 is about. Now, we, we know, because <coughs> we know the situation with the book of Titus, Titus has been left behind on Crete by Paul. Paul, as we were saying, I think it was last week, you know, occasionally he just has to move on <laughs> rather more quickly than he'd wish, whether it's, you know, in a basket over the wall of Damascus or wherever it happens to be. You know, he does such a good job of preaching the gospel, sometimes it gets hot because not everybody believes and he has to go. And he leaves some of the guys behind just to straighten things out a bit. He's left Titus behind him on Crete to sort out a difficult situation. And he's left Titus because Titus is his go-to man for difficult situations. He's a good man in a tight corner. He sorted out the problems in Corinth when Paul had real problems with that congregation. He's been left behind before. He's been sent places before because he's a reliable, seasoned, trustworthy, faithful rock of a man. A rock of a man. And he's been left there by Paul on Crete for this particular purpose. He's to straighten out what's been left unfinished and to sort out the chaos on Crete. Crete is an island of a hundred cities. They are notoriously factious with one another throughout ancient history. They are people who, who are living an immoral life and have a name for being deceivers and liars and deceptive sorts of people and profiting from their logic chopping philosophy. And out of all of that comes their immorality and that's how the ancient world viewed them. That's not a Christian view, that's a view amongst their peers in paganism. So Titus has been left behind to do a big job there and to solve the problems for this newly born church in Crete. What's he got to do? He's got to appoint elders. Why? Because the ministry of the word of God is what's going to heal that place. It's going to heal those people. It's going to heal those churches. It's going to restore their souls. It's going to put a living Christian witness in the place. What they need is the ministry of the word of God. And that's why he doesn't say appoint deacons for your social and your material things. That's why he says appoint elders because elders biblically are set apart for the ministry of the word of God and prayer. Are we catching up a lot on the last couple of weeks? <laughs> Shall I slow down now? <laughs> okay, that's fair. So that's what's going on. Titus, as we've seen previously, is a sound, solid, spiritual battle-hardened character that Paul has trusted to deal with the range of difficult and contentious issues in the churches that have been planted in the place. A solid guy, a safe pair of hands. Paul is writing to Titus with the troubled church on this godless and fractious island of Crete, looking over Paul's, looking over Titus's shoulder as Paul writes to him. There are plurals all the way through the central part of the epistle. 
Paul isn't just, he's conscious, he isn't just writing to Titus, he's writing to the church on that island as well, as he's giving this advice to Titus as to what he should do, to strengthen Titus, to do the right thing, because it's a hard thing he's being told to do. So, appoint elders, says Paul. Because sustainable, sound Bible ministry is what is needed to establish these people in the Word of God and to cure their ills. Appoint men like these, Paul has said, and he's described the character of an elder in verses 5 following. We looked at it last week. All the characteristics there of what an elder is to be, how you're to find elders, what they're to be like, these guys that you appoint, they relate to how a guy is at home. Whether as an elder in his family, as the father figure in the family, or as a steward. He uses the word for elder, he uses the word for overseer. The elder is the, 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 the guy who, who, who runs the family, runs his own family. The overseer is the guy who runs somebody else's family as a steward. In this case, a steward of the household of God. Yeah, we did that last time. All those are the qualifications, and as we said last time, very few of those things um, are listed on the lists that you read of what people are looking for in a pastor. Very few. And then you get to verse 9. <clears throat> Finally, Paul gets past those qualifications, those biblical qualifications that biblical, uh, authentic, or biblically authentic eldership will have. He gets past that eventually to, to what we concentrate on in, in our churches in our day. An elder must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Authentic faith, the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Two things there, did you see that? Hopistos logos, the, the, the faithful message and the faith as it has been taught. And those two things he must hold firmly to. They're not negotiable. They can't be compromised. What we do in the life of the church, what happens in church is what we teach and the practice that follows from that must comport with the trustworthy message as it has been taught. And to do that, the elder must be a guy who holds firmly to those things. Firmly to those things. He won't loosen his grip on those things. Is that making sense? It must not be the faithful word as redefined. We've discovered something new. It must not be the faithful word as recontextualized into a different direction. It must be the faithful word as it has been taught. By whom? It must be the faithful word as it has been taught in that apostolic period by those who were the eyewitnesses of his majesty and the people that he discipled and he taught to walk in his way. And they've written that down. See? The message was the map to the way, and those whose testimony to it we accept learned it from the master whose way it was, or is. And that was important. It is still important, because the church, because it's full of sinful people like you and me, wanders away from that from time to time. Needs to be committed, therefore, to the process of reforming itself to keep getting back to this. A church that is reformed is a problem. Right? Do you believe me? A reformed church is a problem because it was done. But since then, what's happened because of our human nature is that we have unraveled that. And the church of God needs to be in the continual process of reforming itself. Yeah? This isn't news to any of us, is it? If we're not constantly working on that, we've got a problem. And that's why you can't just rely on these occasional visits from Paul and his buddies. You've got to have elders in place in every place who are working on that, holding that message, teaching it every week. And making sure that what we do as a church continues to comport with that message. And it's consistent with it and rings true with it. Does that make sense? That's the importance of what you're doing there, Titus. Keep on reforming to get back to this word. So rediscovery is required, but development is illegitimate. Does that make sense? We continue to rediscover the message as it was, uh, the trustworthy message as it's been taught, but development into another area, development in a different direction is illegitimate. And that's where the problem arises with quite a few guys actually, who recently 
have been coming out with pronouncements out of the evangelical camp but, but they're not evangelical pronouncements do you see what I'm saying here so the elder then has to know this message which involves learning he has to hold to it tenaciously which involves discipleship and some measure of courage and it must be the authentic message not some sexy sounding innovation not style over substance we see a lot of that he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. No disagreements there then. I think you're all right on that. So I can skip a few pages, but I better not drop any on the floor. Why is this so important, a qualification for eldership, the key ministry that needs to be established properly and on biblical lines on Crete and everywhere else in order to restore a chaotic, wayward and damaged church? Why is it important? Is it important for two particular reasons? That man must be such a guy who holds to that faith so that, there's a purpose clause, he can, and there's a kai kai clause here in the Greek, which means both and, so that he can do both of these things, not one or the other, he's got to do both so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. He's got to do both. Now that is the role of the elder. And, uh, you know, shortly I've got to be teaching through this book with a bunch of young fellows. And they're in a university setting and you just know that in the back of their head there's, there's the thought, I could be a pastor. Or in this context, even with them, I could be a vicar. <laughs> Togs, big house, you know. Mm. Fantastic. Look, who's going to sign up for this? You need to be the sort of guy who can encourage others by sound doctrine and, both and, refute those who oppose it. It's a, tough, it's a tough one, isn't it? We need to pray that God will raise up people who can do that because we're raising up all sorts of people for this sort of role who can't do that. They can't do it. Useless for it. Wouldn't say do it or goose. It's not the role in Scripture. So, of course, both these things, you can't pick and choose according to preference or according to your temperament. The elder's role in relation to the word of God that he lives to serve is not onefold but twofold. He must hold faithfully to the authentic as it has been taught faith for these two reasons, to encourage and to refute. And in such a damaged church as, as Titus is dealing with, and, and such a damaged church as exists in Wales today, healing and restoration do not take place as the wayward are tolerated, discussed with and accommodated. It takes place, Paul is saying, as these two things happen. You encourage by sound teaching, by sound doctrine, and you refute those who oppose it, as it has been just defined. There's the remedy. There's the prescription. So let's look at it. Two things. So that he can encourage others by sound doctrine. This, is, this won't take long because this is the easy bit. <laughs> okay? It can't take long anyway. Look at the time. Where churches have erred, there is a price which that exacts. Where leaders in churches have erred, there is a price which that it hurts, it damages, it causes pain. There's a great need for encouragement. Isn't there? People who have, you know, got off the path and been responsible for these things and now begin to see it, they need a great deal of encouragement in coming back. Trying to get through to people, one of the biggest things when you're trying to restart a church, when you're trying to replant a church, you might find just a few elderly left in the back corner and those people need to be loved and cared for and encouraged because they hurt. It's gone wrong. It's nearly shut or whatever. Do you see what I mean? They need to be loved, and if you love them, it, it will pay bounteous benefits, right? Let's be clear. Heresy, errant belief, and the practice that comes from it, they leave wounds and scars, and encouragement is needed. Because you, you realize, don't you, if you have belief that's wrong, practice goes wrong. If we believe such and such, and it's, it's not right, then that causes bad behavior. That's the way it goes. That's how it's been on Crete. That's how it's been right throughout human history. And you know, it's not a matter of varying opinion and debate and discussion. Heresy is harmful and it hurts. It causes damage. The elder is to encourage these people whose, whose lives have become disorderly and damaged and uncomfortable. 
How is he to encourage? He is not to go around telling folks how good they are. That isn't encouraging in Scripture. That's nothing to do with encouraging in Scripture. Too much of what passes for encouragement in 21st century evangelicalism would best be described as deception and flattery. If you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, you see it happening. It's not good. What Paul knows will encourage the genuine, genuine people of God is teaching them the truth about Jesus. You encourage them by sound doctrine. Yeah? He knows that's what works. Parakaleo, the word he uses for encourage, is to encourage in the sense of calling someone to something. You know, say, everything's great, you're doing really, oh, I really appreciate your, your gift of caring and loving and, you know, I'm just looking at somebody, I'm looking at a bloke about this, it feels odd. Um, but, but, um, but, you know, you know oh, I think you're wonderful. That's, sort of, that's not encouragement. What's that, how is that helping that guy? Call him to a biblical view. Call him to an understanding of the fact that he's a sinner, lost, without Jesus. And show him the love of Jesus for him. You know, the truth of the grace of God in the gospel. That'll encourage him, because he, he can grasp that. He knows that's true. If you tell him what a wonderful guy he is, he knows that's not right. It's not going to help him at all. Not encouraging, then, in some vain way to make someone feel better about themselves for a moment, but stiffening their resolve in faith and action by telling them the truth. Stirring people up to faith and good deeds. Good deeds that bring joy to believers in action, not some stagnant, smug, sordid self-satisfaction. First thing he needs to do with this faithful message, as received, that he clings to, is to stir up and encourage, to get damaged people going again in the way. And the second thing he needs to do is this, to refute those who oppose it. You going to oppose the faithful message? Deal with me. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want somebody you're looking at for a pastor or for a trainee pastor or for an assistant pastor. You, you, don't, want, you don't want him to come to you telling you that, do you? You oppose this message, you're dealing with me. <clears throat> Any decent sheepdog, every now and again he's going to have to bite. Yeah? Go in and grip. Why well, the guys will go in and grip? We're not raising guys who are able to do that. And churches are not employing guys who are. Why is that? The elder's ministry, never mind employing guys, the elder, whether he's a full-time elder, pastor, teacher, or not, he's got to be able to do that. He's got to be able to be encouraged with sound doctrine. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but he's got to be able to refute those who oppose. Where do you find these people who need to be refuted that Paul is talking about in this passage? Where, where will I find such a person? We're all friends here. I mean, yes, absolutely. There's our church, we've got a lovely church, big, and there's music, children, young people over there. As long as they're over there, that's fine, isn't it? Uh, where are we going to find these people that have got to be dealt with like this? Titus, you won't have to look very far. Who is he writing to? He's writing to Titus and he's writing to the church. And, and who is Titus to, to deal with as he's fulfilling everything that Paul is telling him here? You're going to find those people, Titus, they're going to find you, and you'll find them sitting in church on Sunday. Because that's the people he's electing elders to, uh, appointing elders to deal with. These people are sitting in church on Sunday. Paul is not dealing in this letter with problems in the marketplace with the unbelieving populace on Crete. He is dealing with the harmful teaching and practice of people in prominent roles in congregations. You need to refute them. And that's why the answer to the problem on Crete is not evangelists, but elders teaching churches the Bible. Scary? We've got the wrong view of church, perhaps. Perhaps we've got the wrong understanding of what it's like in church. Perhaps we've got the wrong idea, therefore, of what elders need to be. Shocking, isn't it, really, to think about that? Aren't we shocked? If we're shocked about the state of things and the things that Paul has to say to Titus about the church on Crete, then look around you at Wales today and weep. Because where are the men in El eldership in this land that we are producing who put their salaries and their pensions and their manses and their respectability and their, their, their being looked to by the congregation on the line and do with backslidden church leaders what Paul says in this passage. 
Fail to do that, it's just saying about your grip on the faithful message as it was taught and cast doubt on your qualification for eldership, says Paul. Teach, pick guys who do this. The guys who won't do this are not qualified. Why? Because that is what elders are there for, says Titus 1, 9 to 16. Terribly serious. And the way I see it, of course, and others have perhaps you've heard me say this before, the biggest problem I have to deal with in trying to persuade Welshmen to follow Jesus is the mess that they see in churches. Now, okay, we're not sort of like good evangelical churches, but believe me, it happens there too. It's serious. If you think it's a minor thing, if you think I'm being contentious, just look at what, why Paul says this is important. Why is it important? Verse 10, because there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. There are many rebellious people, that's why. Many, I think Paul's probably understating it, isn't he? How far is Paul understating that? What percentage of our church, now this is going to get close to home, what percentage of our church, your church, whatever, do you reckon can live with Hebrews 13, 17? I notice the latest translation of the NIV can't cope with it because it's mashed the translation completely. Hebrews 13, 17 does say, as the earlier NIVs said, obey your leaders and submit to them. So imagine yourself now, you're in a situation as a big church down in the south that recently has been going through the process of finding a, a minister and they've had a very thorough process and it's been very unanimously worked through. But imagine a situation like the one they would have had recently where the minister comes along and people just are able to ask him questions. Imagine that situation. Um, <clears throat> what do you expect from us as a congregation? And imagine he cites Hebrews 13, 17. Police are walking in. That's a bit nervous making, isn't it? There are people all over the world today and they... Uh, they're in a situation. Hello? Hi, welcome. Would somebody like to have a chat with her and see how she is? I think she's, she's probably a couple with a copper or something. Yeah, putting her notice up. See, in lots of places today around the world, you'd have police coming in to drag me away, kicking and screaming. <laughs> but actually she's come to put a poster up, which is great, isn't it? Community policing. Imagine that guy in that meeting, as he's been asked his questions, imagine him saying, I expect you to uh, live with Hebrews 13, 17, and I'll live with Titus 1, 9 to 16. It's going to go well, isn't it? <laughs> is he going to get the job? Yeah, well, Paul says, this is what you need. This is what we've got to look for. This is what we need. Somebody's got the bottle to actually say to you, hang on. No, not here, mate. You're not doing that here. This is the biblical requirement. Because there are many whose instinct is to be rebellious. In fact, most of us have got an instinct to be rebellious. None of us likes the sound of it. So here are the troublemakers. Here's how Paul describes them. They are these many troublemakers. They are full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. That makes them three things. Windbags, liars and legalists. My church hasn't got any of them in it. Well, if, if it hasn't, that's for a reason. Because somebody's been on top of it. Windbags, liars, and legalists. Especially those of the circumcision, verse 10, and, and they are those who pay attention to Jewish myths. Now, whether that's Jewish myths from the sort of apocalyptic stuff going around in the sort of Essene Esen communities down by the Dead Sea, you know, where we've got the Qumran scrolls from and all that down there, or whether it's uh, the, 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 uh, the myths, the empty myths of, of, of Phariseeism, adding rules to, to the word of God, you know. Yes, but a Christian will also do this. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith alone, but don't you, you've had Sunday school classes like this, but you don't go to films, you don't go to dances, you know. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, they're the ones from the past, we've got ones now. We've got ones now in our best churches that I hear back from our young people about. 
the Galatian heresy is not dead in our churches. It needs to be consistently addressed and continually addressed. Well, here they are then, these people. Here's their characterization. There's not a detailed description of them, but there is a characterization. They are windbags, matayo logoi, New Testament hapax, which means it's only, this word only comes up once in the New Testament. They are those whose talk is empty or hollow. Big talkers, loud noise, no substance. If I use that expression, all style, no substance, you know what I mean. And you can see that in 20th century, 21st, what are we? 21st century evangelicalism. It's windbaggery. Style has conquered substance. What is it that accredits a ministry? There was a guy with a, a strange Eastern European name on an, uh, writing an American blog, a uh, popular one recently, and Slobodova or something. Like that. I, I've done him wrong. I, I, something like that. And this guy was writing this thing about um, entrepreneurial ministry. Entrepreneurial senior pastors. What's a senior pastor? It's an old guy, isn't it? I, I don't know. I mean, what is a senior pastor in his 20s or 30s? Hmm? Um, <clears throat> he's saying, look, um, should you be looking for that? Where in scripture does it say a pastor should be entrepreneurial? But it's a, it's a must, must have. Have you got this happening? Have you got that happening? Have you got this going on? Are you doing... Uh -uh. When Paul comes to accredit Bible ministry, it's in terms of suffering, rejection, the sufferings he'll undergo, the hardships he'll undertake, the faithfulness that he'll have to the ministry of the Word of God. Style and substance, really important. Where style conquers substance, that's something that's got to be refuted by any faithful elder. In fact, you're showing you are not a faithful elder if you don't do that. So, windbags. Then, uh, deceivers. Managing situations by not being truthful. Deception. Tell me that's dead on planet Earth. Tell me that's dead in the Church of God. Tell me that's only a Jewish problem. It simply doesn't happen in Wales. It does. Windbags, deceivers, especially, not exclusively, those of the circumcision group. The faithful elder is going to be just the man to take on these super spiritual legalists. Don't bring that here. So refute windbags, liars and legalists. How on earth is that going to be done? It's all very well for you to say that, but it's another thing to do it. Right, is it? Paul doesn't say that. Paul says they must be silenced. That's the first thing. They must be rebuked sharply. Does he say, write a nice article being as conciliatory as you can to publish in another evangelical magazine about, well, you know, I think perhaps a, he's a good friend and a, a, you know, a lovely man and all this stuff. He doesn't say that. It says he is leading people astray. He is to be silenced and you rebuke him sharply to achieve it. I don't think I need to say much about that, do I? Do I really? Let's talk about the bit in the middle. What's all this stuff about this, this Cretans are always... I mean, what is that? One of Crete's own prophets, mm -hmm. prophet, has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true, therefore rebuke them sharply. But Paul is obviously setting an example here in the way that Titus should carry on. But what he's done is he, he's picked up this quote from Epimenides. Now, there are people who will tell you it's Callimachus, but actually Callimachus comes later and he's quoting a part of what Epimenides earlier said. We don't have Epimenides written down anymore. We've got references to Epimenides in, in other places and therefore we know it was him. Happy? That's made your day. Right. Okay. So we know this guy was a Cretan uh, philosopher logic chopper, but he was looked at, he was held in awe by the people of the land in a sort of a, a religious sort of way. So they saw him as a prophetic voice in their time, as this sort of spiritually type, prophet, um, um, philosophy type person. And they, they, there are uh, writings speaking of him as a prophet. He's acknowledged as a prophet by his own people within paganism on Crete. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, and then there's this criticism of their truthlessness, their violence, and their gluttony. And Paul is saying, this saying 
is true. What he's doing is he's saying, this is what characterizes the spirit of the age on Crete. This is what they're like on Crete. Now, be careful, because that gets shipped into the church and needs to be rebuked. Does that make sense? This describes the spirit of the age. Now watch it, because that comes in and it needs rebuking sharply. Does that make sense? What's happening with all these evangelicals who are troubling evangelicalism at the moment is they're soaking up the spirit of the age, the whole thing about gay marriage, the whole thing about atonement for sin. Can't accept that. Ooh. Do you see the point? And that is the sort of thing that the elder, the faithful elder, needs to be the sort of man that he can refute that. Because that's what you do with it. So we could use a lot of names. We could talk about Rob Bell, flirting with universalism, came off the uh, Mars Hill congregations, yeah? Very prominent there. Flirting with universalism, now advocating same-sex relationships. Spirit of the age. Brian McLaren, his book, A Generous, Orth Generous Orthodoxy, meaning it's okay to be a Hindu too, because that's the spirit of the age. Don Miller, author of Blue Like Jazz, have you seen that book? I kind of looked at it and thought, there's something wrong with this. When it came out, it, was, it, went, it sold loads and loads and loads of copies within evangelicalism. Tribally, these guys are identifying with evangelicalism or trying to. Now he says he doesn't go to church very often. He just talks to God where he is. He says it's a blast. I find that too, don't you? And then there's Steve Chalk from Oasis. Well, how should we deal with these prominent guys... I mean, Steve Chalk's even an MBE for his work in South East London, you know? How do you deal with that? Guys with good PR and big followings who are soaking in the spirit of the age and trying to make it look like they're still thoroughly biblical Christians when they aren't. Paul says, shut them up. And, and the word that he uses there is uh, epistomizo, to put something across the top of their stomach. Or <laughs> you know, it's like, mm, block their throat off. <laughs> Don't let them talk. To bridle, to stop the mouth, to silence. He's, he's saying, you've got to be ready to, to put a bung in the top of their noise pipe. They've got to be told to put a plug in it. And that's what those charged with leading the church by ministering the word are to be appointed, not elected, and you can see why, to be appointed to do. Because you wouldn't elect a guy like that. He's the guy you need. Why? Because these people are teaching things they shouldn't out aloud, you see, so they need to be shut up. And the effect of the things they are teaching are horribly real. Whole households are being disrupted, says Paul. Wrecking the family. A fundamental building block of human society. Mum, dad, potentially the kids, along with granny, granddad, and any others of the extended family who need to come either inside or alongside for shelter. The family, the fundamental building block of church and society, is being disrupted by the errors they are teaching. Read that into our experience in the 21st century church. There are those who are here today, would be here today, and if they were here, they would give you clear examples of that. Horrendous. How do you achieve this? How do we silence them? We ask them to debate us publicly. And we, we ask them to come on a Christian radio with us and we try and deal with them. No. They are to be silenced by being rebuked sharply. So that they will become healthy. That's the word sound. Healthy in their faith. Rebuke this worldliness that's crept into the church with devastating consequences. Rebuke them. You don't get lessons in doing that in Bible college. You don't get it. Why? It's there. It's in the book. On the basis of the word, the message that you are there to serve, do this. Silence them. Rebuke them sharply. And here's the desirable outcome for the troublemakers, so that they will be healthy in the faith. That is the thing that occupies the attention of an elder. That's what he's for. That's what the man exists there to do. Sound, healthy in the faith, paying no attention to end time speculations, esoteric speculative wisdom, unmoved by disinterested in religion and religiosity, human commands, as Paul says here, being pushed at them by those who would enhance the truth but not enhance it, destroy it.
gives something desperately important to grasp. This is not dividing the church. This is clarifying the church. Why does Paul straight away get off on this bit now in verses 15 to 16 about purity? To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing's pure. See, they're making rules and regulations to try and you know, create purity, especially those of the circumcision group. They're going to try and create purity, but, but no, what's happening by all this legalism being brought in it is their minds and their consciences are being corrupted. Paul's very clear on that in Philippians, isn't he, about the effect of uh, a rules-based religion on, on, on morality. It destroys it. They claim to know God, he says, but by their actions they deny him. Here we go, we've got this again. We've got this, oh yes, I identify with evangelicalism. Rubbish, look at you, look at what you're saying, look at what you're doing. You're not. They claim to know God, says Paul, but by their actions they deny him. What are they? Are they people who have a different opinion? No, he says. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now you go to a guy, you go to the wolf who's been to the costume hire shop and is coming into church in sheep's clothing, you go along to him and you say, hey guy, li listen, scripture says this, you're out of line there. Scripture says this. How is he now responding to you? How does he respond? Either he's going to be healed in the faith, made sound in the faith, which is what Paul's talking about, or something else is going to happen. But what happens at that point reveals where that person stands with God. Yeah? And we are not allowed, if, if we have any responsibility for eldership, if we pray for eldership, if we, whatever, we are not in a position where we are allowed by Scripture to treat that as a difference of opinion, where Scripture is concerned. They claim to know God, but by their actions, that's what's going to speak. Their behaviour doesn't speak of those people holding firmly to the trustworthy message that's been taught, but of accommodation to the spirit of the age. Accommodation. That, that's, that's what we see so often when there's a, a problem in a church. We, well, we must accommodate. Somebody must come and conciliate. Where? In there is that. We must all come together to the word of God and submit to its authority. Yeah? We're not here to accommodate with the spirit of the age to look hip and cool and trendy. Did I say hip? That's not very cool or trendy, is it, these days? Hip. Do you remember that? David, do you remember hip? Man, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. We are here to hold firmly to the trustworthy message. An elder stands to bring that authentic message of Christ to his people. And many, you know, many will hate him for doing so. Sure you want to be an elder? Many will want him to cow-tow to the fancy dress sheep. Paul's having nothing to do with it. No way. That's not a good brother. They're not on the side of the angels. Paul says they're detestable, disobedient and unfit for doing anything good. Out with them. But of course many won't want to live with the consequences of having biblically motivated elders who do this. And they'll want their ministers to be bland and accommodating, unchallenging of backsliding in leadership. And a man worthy to be an elder, though he's going to take this very seriously. And only those guys are to be appointed as elders. To encourage God's people with sound doctrine, to refute all those who oppose it. Well, there's the anticipated objection. It's divisive. And there's the answer to that. So, he who desires the office of an elder desires a good thing. Do you remember it says that? Sure you want it? Sounds like a bundle of grief, doesn't it? You could be a certain sort of guy. And that will sometimes not be a popular or a prestigious person to be. You may need to put your own necessities on the line to be that man. 
You may need to put your body on the line to be that man. It involves sacrifice and loneliness and unpopularity and uncertainty and the courage that is born only of faith. Pray, will you pray, that God will give Wales many such men. Because we haven't got many such men. We have got too many men who also figure in this passage, but not as that man. And God's cause here is paying a terrible price for it. See, we can have conferences and a Scottish church plant that was lamenting this earlier today. We can have conferences galore with people, I shan't tell you the expression quite that he used because I'm not sure I'd want to duplicate it, but, but shooting off their mouths effectively about church planting and church restoration. We haven't got many guys who can do it like this, biblically. We need God to raise up people who will. We need God to raise up those guys and we need to support those guys with all our heart. Titus, you are to appoint eldership like this on Crete. It is for the spiritual health of the church. It, it, is, it is for the spiritual health of the cause of God. It's for people coming to know and love the Lord Jesus. Support biblical eldership, which protects the health of the church by protecting its ministry. And you need to reject any parody of eldership which may be in place that quite simply is not as Paul has described it. And Titus, you're at a point eldership on Crete that will do this. Authentic Christians earwigging over his shoulder on Crete as he reads this must joyfully accept and support the exercise of this service of biblically authentic eldership to the church of God. Because at the end of the day, this church, let's speak for ourselves, this church will not have the leadership it deserves. But it is going to have the sort of eldership and leadership that it supports. And that's the issue that Paul is addressing in Titus 1, 9 to 16. We've got a lot to pray about for Wales, haven't we? A serious law. May God have mercy.